Welcome. I hope you can hear me. I was at the party too. So, um, auditing cryptography. This is the problem that I started thinking on uh, quite a while ago, and I done a little bit of research to see if there was anything that could be done. Um, let's put down what is the problem. Uh, cryptography is mostly implemented through libraries, uh, not just you know final programs. And this is pretty good because we have very few well-managed uh, pieces of code that we can e easily uh, upgrade on the system if there is a flaw, and almost everyone will use it. Um, the bad part is though that it's very hard to get data out of these libraries because the libraries don't have an environment where they can easily you know, create log files or do anything like that because they are embedded into programs and they don't want to disturb this problem. They want to get out of the way as much as possible. So. How do we learn? Uh, these are the questions I ask myself. How do we learn what, what the system is actually using in the operation? Like, if I want to decide on what policy, cryptographic policy to, to, to use in my company, how do I know what is actually going on? What ciphers are being used? Uh, how do I know that if I change the configuration, the system is actually doing what I tell the system to do? Uh, sometimes there will be bugs also, you know, in the, either in the configuration, how I design it or maybe even in the library. And how do I gather statistics so in the future I can change my decision if I want to? So I thought about uh, another area of computing where they actually have a similar problem. They want to trace what's happening in programs. Uh, in general, that is for performance. And there are tools to do that. So I, thought, I started looking at are there tools that I can also use for my purpose. Uh, so tools that are used are tracing through the bug statements. This is the same problem as logging. Like, it's not really something you can do on a library easily because you're going to interfere, interfere with the program. Especially you cannot use it in production. Um, then you can use tools like Ptrace, uh, uh, drive stuff like GDB that actually you know, <laughs> intercepts a program. But uh, again, it's not okay for production first. And then you will have to intercept every single program in your system and wrap it into GDB <laughs> and do something strange there. Uh, and finally, I encountered this thing called eBPF. Uh, and it was interesting because it's low impact and it potentially usable in, produ in production because it mostly stays out of the way. So what is eBPF? Uh, eBPF is a extended Berkeley packet filter. The name comes from because it, it was the initially used in the, in the BSDOS to do packet filtering, but has been since been extended. It's basically a, a limited virtual machine not in the sense of a virtual computer, but in the language sense. And then it can even be uh, optimized in the kernel to a JIT, optionally. And it can kind of run arbitrary code, although the limitations are, are that they cannot do things like loops or anything else, because the, this virtual machine wants to verify that this program does not interfere with the kernel and cannot crash the kernel, stuff like that. Uh, but it can intercept a lot of other code running even in the kernel or in the user space. Um, the other thing is that it requires root privileges in most cases, uh, always, but that's not a big deal for our purposes. So why ABPF? Exactly because it can intercept anything, including anything in any libraries in user space. So at that point I was like, okay, now I can really see everything that's happening in the system if I want to, without having to do any hack on every single binary or, you know, intercept uh, uh, stuff in user space, which is really heavy. Um, the other part I can do is I can gather data in the kernel, so you don't have to stop the program, do some process user space, come back. You can simply gather the data in the kernel and have that other user space program extract this data in the kernel without affecting uh, the program you're probing. And generally has no performance impact because of that. Uh, the other thing is that it does not require code changes, uh, although if you have changes in the code, it might be easy to use. So what, would, what did I try to monitor? Uh, my idea was to monitor specifically TLS ciphers, for example, because it was the easiest thing uh, to look at. Um, there are many ciphers, for example, in TLS 1.2, and there have been attacks over the years, so it kinda, uh, it's a good thing to know what's going on, what's being used, and to inform future decisions. So let's try to find out how to see that. So. The first thing I tried was to use a BPF trace with U probes. So U probes are basically uh, ways to trace user space programs.
by just knowing a function name. So if you know the function uh, that you want to look at, you can use a U ret probe, which is uh, a probe that intercepts when the function returns back, and you can extract, for example, the return value. And uh, in uh, uh, there was this nice function uh, called SSL choose cipher that is invoked when uh, the TLS session is established and you choose which cipher you're going to use for that TLS session. That, that this is called only once for a session, so it was ideal to know how many times a specific cipher is used on the system. And this is the complete program, basically. Uh, if you run this thing, you will get out uh, with this printf what program is using what cipher on the system. So what's good about using uprobes? It's easy to set up quickly. The program can be created very quickly. Um, for some simple things, you could even do a, a single line BPF trace script. Uh, but the, there are some issues with it. First of all, I, I require to install a, a, a truckload of the bug info packages because most of the functions you want to look at are not necessarily directly exposed in, in, in the ELF header. And the probe cannot find the function without knowing where it is. So technically, you could figure out exactly where in memory it does, and, but it, it, it's very complicated at that point. Uh, and it's somewhat hard to pull data from complex data structures. So if the data is hidden through many pointers and stuff like that, it's, it's very uh, annoying to try to pull it out in, in the kind of side. Um, because you have to make a representation of the structure and then try to pull that out. Uh, the other thing is that whenever the code changes, uh, you have to make sure that the bug info packages are exactly of the right uh, version. And if the actual uh, code not only is being updated, but also changes the way it's structured internally, you might have to change the probe over time. So it's, it's very good for one shot, but for something that you want to use over and over, it's, it's less ideal. So I try, then I tried this other thing, it's called USDT probes. Uh, this is really interesting. It does require a little bit more work uh, because it does require it to instrument code. Uh, this is exactly the same <coughs> probe that are used, for example, for system tap, and they're used for doing uh, uh, performance tracing and stuff like that. Uh, and, but it's really simple. It's really just one line that you have to add an header that tells you, that gives a name to the place where you want to look at something, and you can pass you know, the data you want to look at. So in this case, it is a, a somewhat complex structure here, but I don't have to care uh, you know, to try to undo it in the kernel side. I'm just telling, I compile time where that, that data is, and I give a name that I can find without the bug, the, the bug info uh, packages. So, uh, it's easy to get the data you want. As you can see, you can put a, pro a probe in the middle of the function. You don't have to wait till the function ends or anything like that. And uh, the, node, the node debug package is involved. And you don't need to adjust the, the probing code over time, in the sense that if you, are, if you insert this in the, in the source code upstream and this gets maintained, then ideally you don't have to change anything because the name will stay there with the right meaning. Um, but the, on the other hand, if this probe does not exist in the code already, you'll have to patch it. So this is the, 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 the problem with this one. OK, so how do we gather data? Uh, gather data? Um, so there are a few ways to enable probes. One is the BPF trace tool that I use for the uprobe experiment. But you can also go a little bit deeper with BCC, which is the BPF compiler, compiler collections. There are a number of tools they already provide for some common tasks. But you can also create a custom C program or a Python program, which, and that's the, the way I went uh, to do my little experiment. So uh, if you want to know how to use VPF with Python, this is almost all you need to do. If you know already VPF, you might want to read the VPF documentation to know what to look for here. But uh, for finding out how to use it then in Python, that's, that's what I did mostly. <coughs> so let's look at the actual uh, BPF code. So this is an extract from the program I brought. And basically, I embedded a small C program, which then gets compiled into the BPF bytecode inside a variable in the Python code. Um, I just create a small data structure where I hold the data that I want to later pass to user space. And I, I created, in this case, a hash map in kernel uh, so that I can hold a counter for each cipher I care for. And then I just created this function that counts 
cipher. So basically, uh, it, you get a cipher and you increment the hash map uh, with the cipher uh, number as the key. So every time you get that cipher, this counter for that specific cipher, the cipher will be incremented. Uh, the second part is that you have to load the BBF program uh, into the kernel. And so you have to tell what you want to inspect. In this case, this is the uh, LibSSL library. So this, this means that any program that ever uh, opens this and you know, runs this will be intercepted from this point on. And this is the very powerful part of it. You can intercept basically any program using your library. Uh, sorry. Um, then I have to use give it the name that I put into the, in the source code for the USDT case, the USDT probe, and I need to tell it which function uh, to use. And this count cipher use is this <coughs> function that I showed a moment before. And this basically hooks uh, the, the code to the probe that we created in user space, and then we just load the program, and it's in the kernel. Finally, sorry about this. Finally, what happens is that I had a very stupid program that gets this hash map. Sorry about the formatting thing. Uh, and then just uh, goes through the hash map every five seconds and prints out what's in the kernel. So, where the counters are, uh, what, what the counters say. So, this is the, another example that I uh, extracted uh, from, from, my, uh, from my computer that was running overnight. Uh, one weekend. I don't do anything with the computer the weekend, and so I just let it run. And the program was almost identical to the one I showed, but uh, it was also instrumented to look at, at the NSS library, and I just was printing whether OpenSSL or NSS data was being uh, recovered. And it came out with this interesting little table. Um, so it had a, a number of ciphers were being used. Um, and just from the cipher, I can see that some of them are TLS 1.3 because TLS 1.3 defined completely new ciphers. So just by knowing which cipher is being used, I knew it was either TLS 1.3 or TLS 1.2 or probably also earlier. And so I came out and I have about half of the connections, slightly less than half, using TLS 1.3 already, which was uh, quite interesting because TLS 1.3 is, is recent. Um, the other interesting thing is that about uh, a quarter, maybe, of the connections use 256-bit ciphers, and most of them use 128-bit ciphers. Um, another finding was that this is basically just Firefox, because I used rented only the client side in the NSS library, and I didn't have any other client program that I know of running, and so Firefox did do a lot of connections where I was, but while I was not using it. Like most of the connections were done by Firefox. I don't know what it was doing. Um, the other interesting thing is that I didn't ever figure out what this was. Uh, there was a couple of tests that were doing with a simple SSL, OpenSSL server and a simple OpenSSL client just to see if this was working. So I think what, uh, one of these uh, was done by me intentionally. But then during the night, uh, my hypothesis is that uh, D uh, either there is a DNF update kind of thing, or maybe package kit trying to pull uh, you know, the updates for Fedora overnight. Uh, but I don't know, 79. But if there is something running on my machine that is using OpenSSL to pull data from somewhere. Uh, and this is pretty interesting because I have no idea what's going on with crypto. I didn't know what cipher were being used at all over time. And I didn't know how much, how many connections were going on overnight on Firefox or that, was, that there were other things going on. Um, I could have printed, for example, uh, the program name if I, you know, if I wanted to explore exactly what was creating this stuff. I just didn't think of doing it uh, because I wasn't expecting this many connections. So this thing was running and I kind of almost forgot it, and then the next day I was looking at it, oh, this, this is cool. <laughs> and yeah, that's basically it. Uh, I think I was quite fast, but <laughs> any questions? Yeah. So you define your own system that, system that broke in the OpenSSL, so 
Yeah, yeah that's what I did. So is there any reason why you didn't use the system tab for the um, So, yeah, so uh, there are basically... Just the question for the oh, sorry, yeah, why I did use a system tab probe uh, for this. So, basically there are only two kind of probes uh, that eBBF uh, gives you for user space programs. So for the kernel, you have, uh, I think, uh, like 10 or more probes. But for user space, you have only two, the U probes and the USDT, user space uh, dynamic tracing probes. Uh, U probes, you can use them uh, without any instrumentation of the code. And so they are appealing because you don't have to change anything. But as I said before, the, the problems are that if you want to use this in produ production at any time, it's really annoying because the debug info needs to be installed. And that's a ton of stuff, and it's really prone to error. The, the reason why I use the USDT probes is really because although it requires a change in the package, or so what I did is I created a patch and did the R RPM build to rebuild the package, it really allows you to look exactly at what you want. Like, you don't have to scavenge into the data uh, in, the, in the program memory. You just tell, uh, you know, the program basically create this uh, no op operation and put in the health header a pointer that says the data is exactly in this place. And so it makes it much easier to get exactly the data you want out of the program. So yeah, you have to balance whether you can change a program. And in that case, you can use this method. If you have like a sort of a black box, then you will have to use U probes, uh, and you will have to constantly update them when you know you update this program. Yeah, but you can use system uh, system type script to analyze. Oh, why did I, I, did I use eBBF? Also, yeah. the the question morphed into why did I use eBBF with uh, system uh, with these probes instead of uh, using system type itself? Uh, well, one. Very simple reason is I wanted to experiment with eBBF, and initially, well, initially uh, I thought that U probes would be the way to go because U probes allow you to basically intercept without doing any change. And so at that point, uh, I was looking at U probes mostly and systems that cannot do anything without instrumentation. The other part, of it, though, uh, while I was looking at it is that uh, eBBF is much safer to run than system type. Uh, because in this case, I need to. Use, I would have to introduce system tap in the kernel to look at this. Uh, what people do with system tap and user space is they usually look at the program while they are uh, uh, while it's uh, running. Um, is to create basically uh, for this kind of use, create a kernel module that have basically unbounded access to what the kernel is doing. Because system tap is very powerful, but actually it's too powerful. Like if you make a mistake in that program you're running there, uh, and it's easy because it's so powerful that you want to do a lot more, uh, you can easily destabilize the system at that point. Uh, while eBPF, because it's very constrained as a language, forces you to move most of the processing uh, out. You cannot do loops, so you cannot like uh, cause you know the kernel to be stuck <coughs> somewhere. So it's, it's kind of much safer. And so in the end, I, I was like. Yeah, even if I could use system tab, I'm, I'm just not going to continue experimenting with VPF because it has, the, it has these properties. That's so the question I have, you have to code to the uh, source code to What are the prospects to get this code into upstreams and basically have that like a software? Um, like we've opened a cell and analysis. Let me see what it is. Did you this try way. to talk with them and submit so the question is, uh, I had to add code, so what are the prospects of getting this upstream and whether I talk with upstream? So this is just an experiment at this point. I didn't even, uh, I think, show it most of my team, <laughs> these changes I made. So it's a package I built on my machine. Um, however, from the point of view of acceptance, uh, uh, it remains to be seen. I don't think we will have to necessarily carry downstream patches uh, for a long time. Um, I would prefer if upstream uh, adds this kind of stuff um, and because it's basically it doesn't cause any issue to have this code I have good hopes that they will accept it because yes it is a, a code change but this thing is not an instruction in your program what this thing does to the binary it basically introduced two no-op operations like assembly in an op operation. That's all it does. 
And the other thing it does is that when you compile it, it will add a small segment in the ELF header that is only seen at link time, basically, or by the USDD term, that tells uh, eBPF how to hook into it dynamically at runtime. So basically, you have absolutely zero overhead in doing this. So from the point of view of you know, the program itself, there is basically no impact. The only impact is on the fundamentally on the source code and in the health notes. So I hope that most upstream won't have a problem with this kind of thing. The only problem is if we want, if we want to introduce thousands of these, because then the maintenance uh, may be perceived a little bit too much. But I don't plan on, on you know, doing a huge instrumentation for this. It's just key places where you want to audit some use of crypto, at least for now. So I, ho I hope that it will be reasonably easy to, to get this stuff accepted. Are there similar things in other open source operating systems? Uh, the question are, are, are there similar things in other open source operating systems? Uh, so, yeah. so one point of view that your question made me think of is that, yes, this is kind of Linux specific. So some uh, upstream might be a little bit reluctant to have only Linux specific stuff. However, similar, the, the, all this stuff can be really hidden behind a more generic um, uh, macro uh, where you can have this specific Linux system thing coming up. But then on Solaris, there's also D-Trace. So this is, I think, basically all perfectly compatible for you know, compiling in there. And I don't know very well about BSDs, but Again, if you have a macro, you can simply enable it only when you're on Linux. So from the point of view of, uh, of the source code, it doesn't have a, a huge impact. At worst case, you have a macro where you, you don't have anything on the system where you don't have support because the macro will resolve in, def in empty defined. So you don't even need to litter the code with this. You just need to create a macro that does nothing when right. you don't it's have support. About the, uh, for this change to be appealing to the upstream, yeah. There is more than one type of yeah, so the good thing is that you these these dynamic tracing probes are somewhat somewhat common, at least among a couple of systems. So should be okay. And you can easily use this for other kind of tracing and so you can like kind of mix them with the bug tracing if you have that already. Question is, yeah. question is, could I use this system to check that the, for example, system-wide crypto policies are applied correctly? Um, my answer would be kind of. Like, I'm not going to use this to go into the program and look what are the ciphers that are being enabled. Uh, it's like, you can do that in better ways. However, what you can do with something like this is you could have... Um, a list of ciphers that you know you want to allow, or maybe a blacklist, depending on what you look, you know, how you see it. And then you can have like something alert you if you see anything else. Like if you see one of the blacklisted ciphers, or if you see a cipher that is not in your whitelist, you could have this thing sending events to the program, controlling it, like the Python program, and the Python program could like log, look, you have a crypto policy that says that only SHA-256 is allowed, but I'm seeing SHA-1 being used because it's being invoked. Because you could intercept, for example, EVP SHA-1, the, the initialization function for SHA-1, and you can you have alarm and say, hey, SHA-1 is being used, and in theory, you told me that your policies that you don't want to use it. So it could be used to audit whether your system is doing stuff that you don't want to do, or whether your system is doing the things you want to do. Like, you could have other policies that are about checking what is being used, but not about checking the configuration itself. No, as a whole. Yes. I know yeah. configuration somewhere else. Yes, so the answer is kind of yes, if you want to basically audit what you're doing, which is the point of this research. It's about the idea initially was, how can I audit what's going on? And then you can do it, uh, for example, 
to alert, alert yourself, or you can do it for future policy decisions. Like maybe you don't have any whitelist or blacklist, but you want to know what is being used. Like if you see that there is a cipher that is never used, maybe you'd say, well, let's exclude it because nothing using it anyway, and I don't want to risk to have more, you know, attack surface. Or you want to know how hard will it be to disable SHA-1, which is a problem we'll have soon. And you can see, is it being used at all? Maybe you find out that you know most of your system don't use it, and then you like you can have a custom crypto soft policy that says no SHA one because you're fine. There is like make one percent of the connection you use it. There might be you can instrument to tell you what program you use it. There maybe you are like yeah this program can handle you know a failure there, so I'm gonna disable it. So that that this is the idea that sparked a little bit this research, and I hope we can get actually to to build something that does exactly that. Okay, out of time. Thank you.